God's grace and peace to you this day. We are drawing to a close the month of April, hopefully moving from those April showers to those May flowers. Today we're going to be moving both in the book of Acts, but moving on to Paul's letter to the Corinthians to talk about that community there and how it might inform how we live this very day. I invite you to join together in a moment of prayer. In a resurrection faith, we join together, called by Christ from our many places in history, called to unite together to seek God's purpose, called to join in the work of proclaiming Christ's good news. God, you are the three in one bound together, and we pray for the unity of spirit binding us together in Christ, who we've been united with in a baptism. As you write our word, your word on our hearts again this day, may we too be written on your heart that together we may only pursue your way and your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I invite you now to join in singing. Today we read both Paul's introduction in the book of Acts to Corinth and then part of his first letter to the Corinthian people. So hear these words from Acts chapter 18. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he found a Jew named Aquila with his wife Priscilla, who had recently come from Italy because the emperor had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them and because they were all tent makers, he stayed and worked with them. Every Sabbath, he would argue in the synagogue and try to convince Jews and Greeks alike. When we move over to this community, then, he has established in Corinth here, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all should be in agreement 
and there should be no divisions among you, but that you should be united in the same mind and the same purpose. For it's been reported to me by Chloe's people that there are quarrels among you, my brothers and sisters. What I mean is that each of you says, I belong to Paul, I belong to Apollos, I belong to Peter, or I belong to Christ. Has Christ been divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none so that none can say I was baptized in my name. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to proclaim the gospel, and not with eloquent wisdom, so that the cross of Christ might be emptied of its power. For the message about the cross is foolishness and though for those who are perishing. But to those of us being saved, it is the power of God. Here ends our reading in Acts and 1 Corinthians. So today we're looking at both Paul's introduction to Corinth and Acts, but partly and mostly his letter to the Corinthians, at least this first section, and we'll be dealing with this here and there for a little while. But as with all stories, if you don't know the background and some context, you can draw some very strange conclusions from what you read without knowing what's actually, well, going on. So in 146 BCE, the Romans utterly destroyed the Greek city of Corinth, razed it to the ground. A hundred years later, it was rebuilt as a Roman city in this Greek Peloponnese. Due to this massive change in the city's life and purpose, as well as its geography on this peninsula, it's a very different place when Paul arrives there around 50 CE. It had become this important artisan and cosmopolitan city. Um, One scholar referred to it as the Las Vegas of the Roman world, if that gives you some idea of what Corinth might be a little bit like. Roughly around that same time of 50, somewhere in there, uh, historical references tell us that, in fact, the Emperor Claudius did expel all the Jews, and that would be anyone who might fit that label, which would be the early Christian community, and anyone who might sympathize with them. Had them all expelled from that area. And because of this, we get to meet Aquila and Priscilla, a husband and wife team that have fled or been expelled in some way, shape, or form from all of Italy, and now they are in this other area. They go and they run into Paul and however this works and they become friends. They strike up a relationship because they all work in leather or tent making something like this in this cosmopolitan artisan city where these traits would have been uh, celebrated for their skill. Paul, beyond being just an evangelist for this cult as it was called in the time, otherwise we would have referred to it as the way because it wasn't called Christianity back then, these Jesus followers, was an evangelist, but also he made his money, his living, if you will, as a leather worker 
doing all the things you would do with leather, including tent making, as the scriptures will tell us. We assume then bonding over their leather work and their shared passion for the gospel. Eventually, Paul either sends or they go on their own, Priscilla and Aquila, to Ephesus, where Paul then will communicate with them as the heads of the church then in this community of Ephesus. It's important to recognize this, that these people that we meet then serve a purpose elsewhere in the story. It's not just Paul wrote letter to strangers. Ideally, this backdrop has given you a quick little uh, insight so that you can appreciate a little bit better how this letter to the church in Corinth works. So communication back in the day was a little bit different than we do today. Um, Even we probably have ever done in this area of the world. Once upon a time, If you wanted to communicate people long distance, your options were twofold. You could send a letter, which Paul does, or you would send a messenger to relay the message. Now, why would you do that instead of a letter? Well, someone had to bring the letter, whether it be a messenger or otherwise, but not everyone could read back then. So if you sent a letter, you better hope that whoever's receiving it can read and it gets to them because you just don't know. There's no uh, tracking on letters back then. So the message might have been sent, say, uh, through another person. So we're going to get Bob, and Bob's going to take this message from Paul to Tim on the other side of the world or on the other side of a lake or in another city far away. This is how it worked. And so with that, the epistles then are letters to these budding Christian communities, these followers of the way of the resurrected Christ. But the issue we struggle with sometimes is we don't understand what Paul is responding to because we weren't there and we don't have whatever he is responding to. So it makes it difficult because we draw judgments on what he's saying even though we don't know what he is responding to. For instance, imagine this letter. Cornelius, I appreciate your correspondence about the, assembly, the incident at the assembly last week. I do agree it does make sense to have all of these men jailed. They should not be allowed to speak for us before they degrade us all. In all things related to these men, I recommend the strongest response being taken. Tell me all about this event. What men? What did they do? Who are they speaking for? We don't know any of the context of this thing is. Now imagine making your church, your tradition, holy scripture out of that letter and saying, see, this is what God said. Without knowing what came before, it's a little difficult. But if we have the letter beforehand, which we don't typically with Paul, we might get some light shed on what was written from Julius to Cornelius. The original letter, Julius. It has happened again. The mob of vandals has returned to our fair city. In addition to burning our buildings and attacking the elderly, they also tied up all of the children and left them in the central square. Ironically, They say they're helping us and speak on behalf of all of us, and yet our whole community does not wish to associate with them in any way. Is there something we can do to stop these Viking invaders? Could we jail them? Cornelius. That context tells us so much more about what's happening. It's not just random men, but it's an actual group, specific problem with specific people in a very specific context. We like to draw those general things about what Paul will tell us in the epistles, but sometimes we forget there's more going on than meets the eye. So let's talk about this first letter. Paul writes to this budding community in Corinth. He begins by encouraging them, and he says, you should all be in agreement that there's no divisions among you, but you should be united with the same mind and same purpose. Contextually, we understand right away that there's some sort of disagreement that's happening among this community. We don't know exactly what, but Paul will shed some light on us for us. He says that Chloe's people and her household have told us about the quarrels. Can you tell me who Chloe is? Or is she a leader in the church? Does she have some important influence, a special role in the community? We don't actually know. We don't know who Chloe is, but likely with the context we know about what Corinth was at that time, she is likely a wealthy merchant, an artisan of sorts. 
And it's referring to her household, her servants, her slaves, her family, people that she is in charge of. Maybe she is a patron of this budding church. We don't know. But Paul admonishes all of this community and says there's no status to be had by following Paul or Peter or Apollos. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter and there's no status conferred by being baptized by a Paul or a Peter. Paul tells them the only status that matters, the only identity that matters, is found in following Christ. It seems like a pretty reasonable crest, doesn't it? We often create our own identities based on the groups. And we struggle with these same issues, well, today. Our identities in these groups tend to be things about who we see ourselves as or want to be seen as or causes we support or identities of who we are or where we came from. We typically identify as Republican or Democrat or Independent. We identify with our ethnic heritage of where our people once upon a time came from. We identify with the sports teams we follow and we identify often with where we were born. I'm sure that none of you has ever looked at someone who wasn't born in Sheboygan and thought less of them. No one's never made a comment about an out-of-towner from Falls or Plymouth or, heaven forbid, Oostburg. Paul doesn't tell the people you shouldn't belong to groups. You shouldn't have an identity outside of anything else. But he says, in any identity you have, you must be united in Christ. Paul says... It doesn't matter who baptized you, whether it was Reverend Cook or Reverend Taylor or even Paul himself. It doesn't mean anything because the only thing that does matter is that you belong to Christ. It has nothing to do with the person who brought you in. This is a hard thing for us to let go of sometimes, isn't it? Because as much as it shouldn't matter, it still does matter to us. When someone new comes into a group and has different ideas or thoughts, different ways of doing things than we do, we tend to point to our traditions, the things that we have held fast for so long. And until that person has demonstrated whatever we decide is enough entry-level stuff, we're not going to let them in to be one of us until they meet that bar. Paul He also points to this same peace and he says over and over again in his letters, do not fall to the craze of culture, to the craze of the flavor of the day, to the cult of personality, because it's only Christ that matters. Jesus has to come first as Paul sees it. But Paul doesn't just leave it there, which would probably be enough for most of us most of the time. Paul pivots to talk about the power of the cross. The cross, as you well know, is an instrument used to humiliate, to make a public display of someone's suffering, to demean them and dehumanize them. It was Rome's favorite way to put you up as an example, to say, if you do something to cross us, this is what will happen to you. Step out of line, you meet a cross. Paul points to Rome's absolute folly in thinking that the cross holds any real power over the followers of Jesus. Not saying that any of them want to be killed. It's not what he's saying. But he's saying, if you think by killing Jesus, you would somehow did something, you're wildly mistaken. He says, the power of the cross, which you think is a joke, a folly, is exactly where we draw our inspiration and power from. Because the cross didn't end the movement. The cross didn't end the work Jesus was doing. It didn't stop the gospel. In fact, the cross opens up the door for the resurrection. Something new and powerful in the world that has nothing to do with the empire. Paul argues to the people and to any others who would hear it that there is nothing to fear. Not Rome, not the cross. Because of the very example they made on that cross becomes the example of love and forgiveness and power to us. 
This, according to Paul, this is what is that power in that cross. Not the humiliation, not the suffering, not the death, but the new life, the resurrection, love that could not be stopped. Life triumphs over death and love wins. Paul then pivots slightly again and says, you have tasks then. There's work to be done in this early community which applies still to us this day. In light of the good news, we have work to do. First of all, Paul tells this community and all who would follow Christ to recognize that we aren't Christ. Paul is not Christ. John the evangelist is not Christ. Not one of us is Christ. Our role as a follower is not to be concerned with numbers or who brought a member in or brought someone to faith because that's not the purpose. The purpose is to share the gospel message of love. A theologian once wrote that Christians would do better if they could just understand that, in fact, we are not the light, that the light of the world has come in the form of Jesus. And our job is not to be the light, but to point to the light, to be a reflection of that light. Not that I'm so faithful that you should believe, but my faith should inspire you to believe in the resurrection. We're to be signposts, guides for other followers, always focusing in on Christ, not us. In this understanding, we shouldn't let our understanding of status or our assumption of what is important in the family of God dictate anything, anything at all. No one is more important than anyone else, no matter what they give, no matter what skills they have, no matter what they offer. Paul will say later on in letters, there is no Jew or Greek, no slave or free. All are equal as God's beloved children. That's a tough job to this day because we're not used to ignoring status. If someone has earned something, we feel that they have earned that respect and we should offer them deference. And Paul says, not so. Not even Paul deserves that deference. But then the other task that Paul has added into this is to live as the body of Christ as we proclaim the gospel. You remember in other stories, his other letters he writes, he'll talk about how we're all part of the body of Christ, that no one part is more important than the other, that in fact we don't exist without all of us together. Paul more or less asks us, how do we let go of our tribal affiliations so that we might live united by Christ? Paul doesn't say your identity doesn't matter. Paul doesn't say that what makes you you has no bearing on this world. He doesn't say identity is a bad thing, but he does say that we need to let go of our surface identities and recognize our core identity as the body of Christ, as a follower of Christ, as one who lives into that gospel of love. When we let those surface divisions divide us, we give the power back to the empire, to Rome, and give the power back to the the cross in the way of death and humiliation, not love. This new community who was gathering around this message, around the cross, around the words of Paul to inspire them to follow Christ, needed a different understanding of what it was to live in this world. Many of you will remember the famous line that Abraham Lincoln delivered. A house divided against itself cannot stand. And a fun fact on that one, Lincoln took that from the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus himself said something along those lines. If we're to live as these people united in Christ, a people who work toward sharing of the Gospel of love and all that we do, we just can't let our trivial identities rule us. We have to join together Packers and Bears fans, Badgers and Wolverines, locals and transplants, and be united in the power of the cross through the gospel of love. We have to build these bridges among these groups of people that might seem like they don't fit together 
so that we might work together as the body of Christ to both proclaim Rome's folly of the cross and embrace the love of the resurrection and the gift of God. What will you do to bridge those divides, to see yourself as a child of God, and more importantly, to see those others as children of God too? Amen. Let us join together in a time of prayer. Sometimes it's so hard to see your power in the midst of this world today, God. What can love do when there is so much trauma, so much hate, so much violence, so much despair? And yet, we believe that only love can overcome. And so we pray for your power of love to heal in the bodies and minds and hearts that suffer in the communities that are torn apart, in the leaders who use force, not love, in people who are oppressed, and even in your creation, which cries out for relief. May your resurrection life become real to all of us all the more. This day we pray for the power of your love to heal divisions caused by dehumanizing worldviews, things like racism, bigotry, 
discrimination, inequity, problems caused by war, by climate change, by grief, by the disregard for dignity and life in this world. May your resurrection life be real to all of us. We pray for the power of your love to heal your church, our towns, our nations, even our world. May your resurrection life be real to us. And we pray that by the power of your love, we might always be found working on the side of life, working on the flourishing of your kingdom, that it might come even in our days. It's with great hope in the one you sent us to show a more excellent way that we raise our voices together and pray as he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the power and the glory forever. Amen. All as partners in Christ's service And now, my friends, as you head back out into the world to do all that it is you do, remember that you too are a part of the body of Christ, that our sisters and brothers, whether we agree with them or not, whether we like them or not, too, they all are a member of the body of Christ. They are all sisters and brothers in faith, worthy of love, worthy of of respect, because we are all united in Christ. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Amen.